pleased to have you with me today. This is fabulous. And so I'm Ashley Gatewood. I am the communications and marketing director at CFRI International. And you may remember me. I worked at the Fundraising Institute of New Zealand for a couple of years, 2011 to 2015. Been to many an FA conference, BBCon Sydney, all these wonderful things. So this part of the world is very near and dear to my heart. We're going to jump right in, and I am a team of one today, so throw your questions into the question pane, and I will do my best to answer them as we go through the presentation. Um, it's just me, so if you can bear with me a little bit, I'll try to get to everybody's questions, but I'm so excited that you're here with us. So we'll begin with our FAQs. So the application cost is 700 US dollars if you are the member of a participating organization. So participating organization would be FINS, FIA, Educate Plus, Japan Fundraising Association. We have a number of partners in the APAC region and they are listed on our website. Then our other frequently asked question is, where can I find all these things that you're gonna talk about today? The candidate handbook, the test content outline and the glossary. And they're all front and center out on our website for you. So when I reference these, you're welcome to grab them. And I'm also recording today's webinar and I will send you a follow-up email within 24 hours that has a link to the recording. So with that, we're going to start with a poll and we'll just look at how long have you been professionally fundraising? So three years or fewer, four to five years, six to 10 years, more than 10 years, let us know. All right, I'm gonna close the poll in three seconds. In three, two, one. All right, fabulous. So we'll just take a look here. So it looks like we've got people from all areas, from all, all lengths of time in here. So that's fabulous, excellent. A lot of people six to 10 years, awesome. So no matter where you are, we can help you with your C-free application and getting that underway. So who are we? Well, we're the Certified Fundraising Executive Certification, and we've been around since 1981. And we're the only globally recognized accredited certification for fundraising professionals. So if you earn your CFRE in Auckland, and then you move to Melbourne, or you then move to Bangkok or to Beijing, it means the same thing anywhere in the world. So you take it with you. And that's one of the benefits because we know that there are a number of fabulous certificate programs out there, but those may only be really country specific, right? So this is the only one in the world that is truly international. And a lot of times people say like, why would I do this? Why would I become a CFRE? And I'm gonna get to that on the next slide. But there are a lot of reasons. And I think about if you've ever, been on the hiring side of uh, interviewing, you know, everyone walks in and says, I'm amazing, I'm great, I got these fabulous results. Well, the CFRE is really that proof in the pudding for you, right? That is saying that you've had your knowledge base tested against international standards. So when you're going for your next job interview, you're negotiating your next raise, all of that good stuff, the CFRE are four letters that stand behind you to help you with that. So some other reasons why people become a CFRE. So we did a survey in 2018 and we asked people, why did you become a CFRE? And the number one reason people said was to demonstrate their knowledge to others, right, in the space. We all have had those doubting Thomases or especially when you're earlier in your career and people think that you don't know which way is up just because maybe you don't have as many years of experience well, that's not necessarily true, right? So the CFRE is that proof that you know what you are talking about. All right. It's also a great way to improve your fundraising knowledge because the CFRE process, as we'll talk about, is a key way to help shore up any gaps in knowledge that you have. And I'll tell a quick little story here. I... Um, uh, I have somebody here with an audio question. So if you just bear with me, I will um, type my answer to them. So is that I once was giving this presentation to a person or to a group in St. Louis, the US. And this woman said to me, I've done major gifts for 
15 years, I don't need to become a CFRE because this certification is a generalist certification. Okay, well, that may be true, but the thing is, you need to have generalist information because you have to know how your piece knits into everything, right? You need to have a holistic view of fundraising. It's very dangerous to think that just because you're really specialized, you don't need to know anything else. For all of us that remember 2020, we possibly worked in a fundraising department where some of our team was made redundant, was on furlough, and maybe you had to step up and step in and do fundraising in areas that you weren't familiar with. Maybe you needed to do volunteer management, maybe you needed to do events, things you hadn't touched before. And so if you've had the CFRE experience, then you're able to have the confidence to go in and say, yep, I got this. And that all makes you a more valuable asset to your organization. Another reason that people tell us they became a CFRE was just, it was a personal challenge to take on. They wanted to see, okay, do I really know what I think I know? Is my fundraising up to scratch? And this is a fabulous way to know that. Also, if you manage a team, you wanna set an example for that team, right? We know, especially with millennials and Gen Y, that they really value certifications and that they want to work for people that are smarter than them that they can learn from. So how do you prove that to people, right? When you're hiring, how do you create this? Uh, how do you show people that you are a team that is working to international best practices, that you're ethically fundraising, right? People want to know this. And so you give that assurance to your team. Other people say, hey, you know what? I'm just a lifelong learner. This was a natural progression for me to do this. And to pinch hit. And so by that, I mean, let's say your colleague goes out on medical leave unexpectedly and you need to fill in. Again, maybe people get furloughed in your department. You need to be able to step in seamlessly and help out. So the CFRE with this generalist knowledge is what's gonna really help you with that. Now, I know a lot of people are probably on this webinar thinking, you know, I don't know if I want to be a CFRE. I don't know if I want to go through this process. I'm fundraising just fine. Um, but we all know that it's very dangerous to get complacent and to think that we know everything because nobody does, right? And that's the CFRE process is there to help you identify those fundraising gaps in knowledge. My recommendation to you is to start your application for free on our site. It's totally no obligation. If you just pop on over to our homepage, there's two places where you can start it and start logging your information. If you decide not to progress with it, you've not paid anything, you've had a look around the application and you've gotten familiar with it. The application is mostly looking at what you've done in the last five years. And the reason for that is because the CFRE carries a lot of weight and we wanna know that your experience is recent. And I often will talk to people who will say, you know, I fundraised from 2000 to 2011 and then I came back in in 2019, can I get my CFRE? And what we're looking for is those most recent five years of experience. So someone in that situation, that would not be, they would not be eligible at the moment to do it, right? You need to have um, five years, and I'll get into this in a minute, but of experience. The application itself won't expire, so you can take your time logging your information into it, so you can log in and out as much as you like, and the first piece of the application is education. And this is the one where most people have a lot of questions. You need 80 points earned within the last five years. And you're probably thinking, thanks, Ashley, but I have no idea what a point means. Well, we'll get into that. So one point equals one hour in a session. So let's say you go on a one hour webinar about corporate sponsorships. That's one point. Right, easy peasy, one hour in a fundraising session equals one point. If you ever present, you will get two hours for, or sorry, two points for every hour that you present with materials you already had. And the first time you present a new presentation, we're gonna give you three points per hour to take into account the prep time that you have done in putting that presentation together. We can count up to 36 points for presenting. And if you don't present, if you prefer to attend, that's totally fine. No worries at all. You don't have to present. But if you do, you will just get those points a little faster. 
We also take up to 10 points for attending relevant non-fundraising education. And I have to stress that word relevant. We had somebody once submit an application and part of their non-fundraising education was a chocolate making course. Sounds delicious. However, you can't really draw a line between how making chocolate helps you be a better fundraiser. Now, something that would count would be, say, managing different generations in the workforce, maybe going to time management course, maybe going to business writing course, right? These are the things that we can draw a line between your work as a fundraiser and your success, right, doing that. Now, keep in mind, all of these sessions need to be at least 45 minutes to qualify. And that's super important because so many conferences now have these 30 minute, 15 minute, 25 minute kind of fast sessions, right? But they don't have enough meat necessarily to uh, make sure that that information that you need gets across. So that's why we have this minimum 45 minutes on a session to qualify. All right, now we have another great way that you can earn education points and that's called service learning, which is essentially our term for volunteering. You can earn up to 10 points for volunteering and that's one point per year per org that you volunteer with. So that could be your place of worship, that could be uh, your child's school, that could be with your local football club, whatever that might look like. And then if you're on a committee or a board, with a nonprofit, you can earn two points per year per organization. Another way to earn these education points is through any academic degrees that you might have. And we don't require an academic degree. So if you don't have one, that's no problem. But if you have one, awesome. We're gonna be able to award you some points for that. So we will take a bachelor's, master's, I don't think a JD is as uh, prevalent in your neck of the woods as it is in North America, but um, or a PhD doctoral degree. And it can be any year, any major. So me, I have a bachelor's of English from 2002 and a master's in advertising from 2005. So I would get 10 points for each of those. So any year, any major. If you went to a community college or uh, like tech, then you will get five points for that degree. And we can combine those in any way, any of your degrees, but we can only take up to 40 points. So if you have 12 PhDs, I'm sure you're a fabulous conversationalist and I'd love to sit next to you at a dinner party. However, uh, while you have all those wonderful things to talk about from your study, we can only take up to 40 points from your degrees. All right. Now, at this point, sometimes people think, well, what exactly counts? Because there's a lot of education out there and I'm a little foggy on what might or might not count. So if you look at your screen now, you'll see there's heaps and heaps of things that count. Webinars are a fabulous way to earn points. There are so many free ones right now and there's so many quality ones on great fundraising content, especially around navigating COVID that are really helpful. If you go on lunch and learns, conferences, um, I know, for instance, like the FIA conference that just finished last week, they have made recordings available of sessions. So if you go back and listen to those, you can also get credit, right? So any kind of audio, video recordings from conferences, uh, roundtables, all these really good things, they're all going to net you points. So sometimes when people see that 80 point number, they kind of have like, you know, a little minor death inside and they think, oh my gosh, how long is this going to take me to get these 80 points? But don't, don't worry about it. it it's going to be, it's going to be fine. There are a lot of ways that you can earn points, but there are some things that don't count. So for instance, one is any presentation you make for work. If you make a presentation to your board about what, we've done in the last quarter, right? That's not the kind of presentation that we're looking for. So that's not going to count. That's just you doing your job. If you present non-fundraising material. So I had a woman ask me two years ago, she said, Hey, I'm a swim coach. I teach swimming. Can I get credit for that? And unfortunately, no. So we can give you up to 10 points for attending non-fundraising relevant education, but we cannot give you any points for presenting non-fundraising material. Also, anything that happened more than five years ago, with the exception of your academic degrees. Networking events, right, because they don't have an agenda. You might just be talking about 
your batch or holiday house, whatever. We don't necessarily know that that's going to have uh, the meaty fundraising content needed to earn you those points. Awards events, mentoring sessions, and listening to podcasts. So those do not qualify. Now, when you go on a training, you might think, okay, you know, I went to this conference and it was 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. That means it was seven hours. That means I have seven points, but we're only counting the actual instruction time. So we need to subtract out all of the breaks, the cocktail receptions. If you missed a session because you were on a work call in the lobby, you know, those kinds of things we need to subtract out. So usually when people go to a conference, they get more like 4.5 to 5.5 points per day there. Now, let's head over to this slide. So this is a points tracker, and sometimes people freak out because they go, I don't have any of these. Don't worry about it. 100% do not worry about if you do not have any points trackers for whatever you've attended. It's totally fine. These are not necessary. But a lot of conferences like FIA and FINS, they will provide these CFRE points trackers for you. And essentially this makes it super easy because you can see on your screen, it says, okay, session one nets you 1.5 points. Session two nets you 1.5 points. And then you can just tick up those little boxes and it's a super easy way to add up how many points you got. Now, if you would like a copy of any of these, FIA and FINS can usually provide them, but you're more than welcome to email me at that share at cfre.org email address, and I will be happy to send you the ones from any conferences if you would like to have those. All right, so we are now at our first question break, and if you have a question, feel free to type it into the question pane here. All right. And it looks like we have a question. Could I get credit for a conference I attended in 2015? Unfortunately, because that is more than five years ago, that would not be able to qualify for education. All right, and we'll keep moving. So the next piece of the application is professional practice. And the easiest way to think about this is just you working, right? You're working, that's your professional practice. And we need 36 points here and one point equals one month of working. So super easy. You just need to work 36 months out of the last five years. We understand there's maternity leave, medical leave. You know, you might be unemployed for a spell. Totally fine. That's why we don't require five out of five years. We're very understanding life happens. So you just need to have worked 36 months in the last five years. If you are a consultant, you will need to start counting from the date of your first client. So what I mean by that is, let's say I became a consultant on January 1 of 2021, but I didn't actually get my first client until March 2021. So I'm going to count my time as a consultant from March, right? Because I need to have a client to actually be consulting. Because if you just say, hey, I'm a consultant, and maybe you just got some business cards made up, that doesn't mean that you're actually actively working in fundraising consulting. All right. Now, 50% or more of your job needs to be fundraising related. So if you wear the PR hat half the time and you wear the fundraising hat half the time, totally fine. That totally works. If you work 20 hours a week, um, which I know uh, part-time jobs are far more common in uh, APAC than they are in the US, and you're all very lucky because um, us Americans, we just seem to work forever, don't we? Um, but if you work 20 hours a week, then 100% of your duties should be fundraising related. And if you're not there, it's no problem. So if you've only been working a year or two, that's totally fine. What you can do is start your application and then keep logging your education and your points in there until you hit that 36 point mark. And that's a really common thing that people do earlier in their career. They'll just say, you know what? I haven't been doing this for 36 months. I'm gonna start my application, enter my info, and then when I hit 36 months, I'll be ready to press submit and I will be all good. All right. Professional performance. So this is you raising funds, all right? And 
This is 55 points and one point equals 25,000 US dollars. And I know people go, well, why is this in US dollars? Because I'm not in the US. And the reason for that is that we are accredited. So we are only allowed to have one currency for this. So we're not able to have one amount in Thai baht and one amount in Brazilian real and one amount in euro. So we do have a currency converter in the application, very um, easy to use and straightforward. If you want to report an event, you just report the gross. If it's a bequest that somebody has left you, that needs to have been received or it needs to be an irrevocable pledge, right? You can't just have Rod Stewart call you up and say, hey, Oxfam, I want to leave you 20 million US dollars. And then you're like, woohoo, I've just met my CFRE requirement, right? It's got to be something that's an irrevocable pledge or has to have been received. And secure grants, those will count as well. Um, all right. And we've had a question come in. Can you confirm that 20 hours a week for a month can be counted as one month? And that is correct. Yep. So if you work 20 hours a week and you're fundraising full time, then that will be fine. Um, all right. And we'll mosey on. I've got another question break coming up. So I'll get to some of the other questions then. Now, professional performance. If you work in a smaller shop and you say, Ashley, you know, I can't make this dollar points requirement that you have, you can earn points through management or communications projects. And we have examples on our website. And just to give you a high level overview, a project needs to have a start and an end date. So what you would want to do in that sense is think about it like if you overhauled your bequest toolkit and it took you a few months and you released it out into the world and your number of pledges grew by 19%, right? That's a project. But if you just hit send on your e-newsletter every week, that's not a project, right? Even if you're just putting your e-newsletter together every week, that's not a project, right? That's just you doing your job. We're talking about something that's a discrete project with that kind of start and end date. And we have examples on our website that have uh, actually been submitted to us. We've scrubbed all of the identifying info, but you can see what has actually counted for people. All right. Um, I highly recommend that you store your information around the CFRA application somewhere that you can always access it. So what I mean by that is we do request that you keep proof of your attendance or participation in education sessions. So this can be a receipt. This can be a confirmation email. If you watch a webinar on demand, you can screenshot the first and last slide. If it was a conference or a masterclass or something like that, you can keep the harder soft copies of those event agendas. And the, one of the reasons that people call us in a meltdown is they change jobs or suddenly for some reason they're not at their job and then they say, oh my gosh, all my CFRE proof is in my old work email and I can't access it. So I would just say, if you go to a conference and you've got that confirmation email, I would just forward it to your personal email and then in your personal email have a folder called CFRE proof and just keep everything there. And then that way you will never lose access. So we talked about the cost for members of participating organizations. And I think sometimes people see that amount and they go, crikey, that seems like quite an investment. Well, this is what I'd like to say. There is a lot of research out there that people with certifications can command higher salaries and that they have a faster time getting employed. And in fact, we have found that in our last CFRE certificate survey, which was 2018. We were supposed to do one in 2020, but obviously because of COVID, we didn't think that the uh, data would probably be as uh, comparable, right? But you should think of this as an investment that's gonna pay dividends, 
right? If there was a stock that we could all go out and buy for 700 US dollars and it was going to help us earn three, five, six percent more in our salary every single year, we would all go out and buy it, right? Exactly. So that's a good way to think about this is that it is an investment. If you're not a member of a participating organization, the cost is $875. And like I said before, you're only going to pay when you want to submit the application completely free to get yourself started. That fee includes our application review. So essentially, if you submit your application and we find an error, we'll ask you to resubmit it, but there's no cost to resubmit it. So just don't worry about that at all. Um, you can also request us to review your application before you hit the submit button if you like, but just know that if we do find an error, you're not going to be double charged to resubmit it. You'll also receive a digital badge that you can use on LinkedIn, your email signature, wherever you want on the web. All testing fees, so we'll talk about the exam in a minute. And then we're also going to mail you a hard copy of your certificate. So you can frame that, you can display that wherever you like, but that one fee includes all of this. This is what the digital badge looks like. And this is one that I snagged off someone's LinkedIn and I hit all their personal info. But you'll notice in that red square down the bottom, it had 147 reactions and 32 comments. People get a lot, a lot of attention for these. So when you want to announce to your network that you're a CFRE, using our digital badge is an awesome way to do that. All right, so I'm just going to address a few quick questions here. So one person's asked, is the 55 professional performance points in addition to the 80 points? And yes, so the one section is 55 points, and then the other section is going to be 80 points um, in that regard. Now, someone has asked, how do I prove funds raised from a past employer with the last five years. So one way we could look at that would be from your annual report, right? If you tell us that you raised two million dollars in the last five years, and then we look at your annual report and it says that you raised seventy thousand, which I, that would be a really crazy annual report. I don't know how the organization would exist, but you understand what I'm saying. So that that would be uh, one way that we would be able to look at that. Um, and then someone's asked, what about points for professional performance for regular giving? So if that money has actually come in, then you're going to count it. So you can't say like, oh, you know, in December, I think $20,000 is going to come in through our annual giving. But, you know, if you're looking at what's coming through January, February, then you're going to be able to count that if you're on, if you're on that team that's working with the regular giving. All right. Now, the testing windows are on your screen, and I don't know why my space bar doesn't want to cooperate. So our exam is offered in four windows a year, and if you look at your screen, you will see what those windows are. We offer days every day of the year, except for December, and when you submit your application, you will need to pick your test window. So you don't have to pick the actual date, but you need to pick the window. And that is when you are going to say that you will sit for the exam. Now, you'll notice that the first day of every testing window is a deadline. What that means is if you want to sit for your exam in the April 15th to June 15th window, you just need to submit that application by April 15th. It's going to take us a few days to review it, and then we're going to send you all the instructions of how to schedule your exam once we approve your application. So don't submit your application on April 15th and think, oh, I'll just sit for my exam on April 17th. I would give us at least about, you know, 10 business days in there to make sure. But, um, and you, you know, you can submit your application. If you want to sit for it in the April 15th to June 15th window, you can submit it now. If you want to sit for it in the October 1 window, you could submit it now. That's fine. But you will just need to tell us which window that you want to use. There is a $35 US dollar fee to change windows, and that's to prevent people to keep pushing it back. Once your application is approved, you will have one year to sit for the exam. That is more than enough time to study, I can guarantee you, and we'll talk about study times coming up, but just know we give you a lot of flexibility. So if you have a really crazy couple months at work, your personal life is hectic, whatever, you know, you've got one year to sit for this exam, so we're very fair in that. If 
you need to change your test window for any reason due to COVID, we will waive that $35 fee. All right. Now people think, okay, there's this exam and I'm terrified of the exam. I haven't sat for an exam since uni. I don't even know how to study. It's been too long. Am I Zen vibe that I'm trying to send you through this webinar platform is just don't worry. Try not to worry. I just watched a documentary. Maybe you saw it called The Last Dance about Michael Jordan. And somebody said, Michael Jordan is so successful because he doesn't worry about missing a shot he hasn't taken yet. And I thought that sounds just like the CFRE exam. So get in that positive frame of mind when you think about the exam. Now, if you have five or more years of experience, we recommend that you study at least 40 hours. And if you've been fundraising for fewer than five years, we recommend that you study at least 80 hours. I'll show you exactly how you'll determine what you need to study. Um, we do offer a resource reading list and there are ways you can rent, borrow, buy, or listen to the books on that list. So if you're like me, I'm one of the most frugal people you'll ever meet. Uh, I've got some tips for you on how to do this frugally. Now, the exam covers these six knowledge domains. You can see on your screen here, we're very transparent about what is on the exam, right? Very upfront, this is what it's gonna cover. And securing the gift and relationship building make up 49% of the exam. So that's a huge focus when you study. I highly recommend that you devote ample study time to those two areas. We offer the test content outline. This is, you know, because when you look at those six knowledge domains, you're like, okay, Ashley, current prospective donor research, that's a pretty big umbrella. And it is. So we break it down for you in this test content outline, all the nitty gritty. And what I recommend is that you print this out, grab a highlighter and highlight anything that you don't feel confident you could answer a test question on. Or something that you've not done directly in your professional experience. Go ahead and highlight it. Then you can make your way over to our resource reading list. And this is a list of 14 books on our website. Most people only read one to three, so don't think you have to read all 14. And it will show you exactly which books address which knowledge domains, right? Because we don't want you to waste time studying stuff you already know inside out. This is going to show you exactly the books that you need to address the areas you need to study, right? Because you highlighted them on that test content outline. So if you're Highlights were clustered in knowledge domain one or knowledge domain two. This will help you know what to look for. And then you'll see the second book here, Fundraising Basics, says it's comprehensive. So if you feel like you were highlighting all over the map, then that would be an option would be to look for a comprehensive text. You may want to borrow books from CFREs. A lot of times people who've just passed the exam, you know, they'll still have their books and they'll be more than happy to lend them to you. Most libraries have a budget for ordering new books. So you may want to ask your local library to get them in for you. This is a hot tip I got from a CFRE, which is to ask your employer to purchase them for the team. So if you don't want to pay for them, you could go to your employer and say, look, you know, how would you feel about buying these two books? And when I'm done reading them, they could be made available to everyone on our team because what employer doesn't want to think that their staff are reading up on fundraising? And if you decide to form a study group, you may want to divide and conquer who buys what books with the folks in that study group. So this is my favorite hack of freeness. This is the Achieving Excellence in Fundraising book. It is probably the most popular book that people use when studying for the exam. And this is taken from the Australian Amazon website. And you will notice that it is free with an Audible trial. If so, if you want the audiobook free, I should say audiobook is free, not the hard copy. But if you want to get access to all the great info in here at no cost, you can get that for free with an Audible trial. And they run this promotion constantly. So uh, have a look, see if it applies, because it's a great way to get this information at no cost. Now, people say, 
what is the exam like? I'm really scared of the exam. I want to be a CFRE, but I don't want to take this exam. Well, I want to put your fears in check. The exam is global. So whether you sit for it in Perth or you sit for it in Amaru or you sit for it in Osaka, it is going to be the exact same exam. It is computer-based and there are no country-specific questions. There is a false rumor circulating that this is an American exam and it is, I guarantee you it is not an American exam. Our exam committee is made up of eight CFREs from around the world, uh, was chaired by an Australian. So it is not leaning towards one country's information or another. These are all best practices in fundraising that apply no matter where in the world you are working, okay? And it's written at that five-year practice level. So that's why we said, if you have fewer than five years experience, you're gonna to wanna to study for 80 hours or more. It's 200 multiple choice questions. And that's really cool because there's four options per question. And that means that the correct answer is staring back at you. There's no open-ended questions. There are no essays. It's all entirely multiple choice. We're looking for the best answer. So sometimes people go, well, two of these look correct, but we have to remember only one can be the best. And that kind of mimics life, right? Doesn't it? Because sometimes we're at work and we're like, okay, there's four options or there's multiple options on how we could do this thing, but only one of those can be the best, right? And so that's what this exam wants to help you get comfortable with and measure that best practice fundraising. Now, you have four hours to sit for the exam. And I will tell you right now that we get all the data back from the test center on how long it actually takes people to do this exam. On average, it takes three hours and 15 minutes. That means that you will have ample time to check your work because you, you can move backwards and forwards in the exam. It also means if you get stuck on a question for five minutes, you're gonna be okay. So as long as you keep yourself moving, you should be more than fine. We're, we're generous with the amount of time we give you. Every question ties back to a point on the test content outline. So nothing is gonna jump at you from left field. Like I said, you can move back and forth. So let's say I'm super hung up on question 22. I get to question 94. It jogs my memory about question 22. I can just pop on back to question 22. The score range is 200 to 800 and 500 is passing. And so the score is weighted, right? So different questions are worth different points. You're not gonna know that when you sit for the exam, what's worth what. Just do your best to answer every question as best as you can. We have scoring information on the CFRE website. I'm not a psychometrician, so I'm not gonna drone on about something that I really don't, uh, you know, have a huge body of expertise in, but the 500 is the passing score. And that means that if you get a 498, it's not passing, right? It has to be that 500, but we have a pass rate of about 80%. And sometimes people, when I give this in person, I see their faces and they look terrified. And I say, you know what, if 100% of people pass this exam, it wouldn't mean anything, right? It wouldn't be doing its job. It wouldn't be a, a very good exam, right? Because it needs to be something that is determining who is confident and has the basics of best practice fundraising cemented, right, into their fundraising practice. We do have two options on how you can take this exam. So one is from your home or office and the other is in person at a test center. So you can pick whatever you want. It doesn't change the fee, right? So that $700 um, discounted fee, you know, that covers however you feel most comfortable testing. If you do decide to go to a test center, I have New Zealand up here as an example, you can go to pearsonview.com slash CFRE and type in your postcode. 
and then it will show you your closest test center. So I just ran the search here for New Zealand. You can see that there are locations all over New Zealand. There are heaps all around Australia. Um, there are 5,000 test centers worldwide. So there's a good chance that there is one close to you. When you finish your exam, your score appears straight away and you will not see what questions you got right or wrong. So I met a man at a conference once who said to me, I'm not gonna study for your exam. I'm just gonna go and take it. And when I see what I got wrong, I will then just study to what I got wrong. Well, unfortunately that plan is not going to work because you're not gonna see what you got right or wrong. And that's to protect the integrity of the exam, right? Because we don't want Susie taking the exam on Monday seeing what she got right or wrong, and then talking to Jono on Wednesday and saying, hey, you know, when you see such and such question, you need to pick this answer, right? So that's all about exam security. You will get a confirmation email within, within one business day from us. And that's because you will know you're a CFRE before we do. So all of the uh, scores get sent to us in a batch every 24 hours from around the world. Once we have your score, we'll send you that confirmation email. And then at that point, you can add CFRE to your business card, your LinkedIn, everywhere that you want to add it and shout it from the rooftops. We mail the certificates monthly from the East Coast of the United States. And so you will get yours in the mail, but just know if you pass on a Monday, it's not exactly like you're going to have that certificate hit the mail on Tuesday, right? We do mail them in batches. And you'll get that digital badge within a week. Recertification. I've had people say to me, Ashley, I think this recertification makes no sense. If I pass your exam and I prove that I did all this education, why would I need to recertify? All right, well, you may recall earlier, I told you I had a master's degree in advertising from 2005. What has changed in advertising in the last 16 years? Now let's think about that in fundraising. What has changed in fundraising in the last 16 years, right? The world keeps moving. We've got all these things about digital fundraising. We've got different generations, right, that are, that are now giving more. This is the reason why we need to recertify. And this is why CFREs command the respect that they do and that they enjoy so many career benefits. It's because you are proving that your knowledge is not trapped in 2005 or whatever year you pass the exam, right? Your knowledge is always current. That's why people love to hire CFREs. So every three years you recertify and it's an online application. It's um, 510 US dollars at the regular price and 408 at the discounted. Right. Now, a lot of people get this built into their next job contract. So let's say I work for Charity A and I become a CFRE and a year later I am interviewing at Charity B and they make me an offer. Well, I know in two years that I'm going to have to recertify for my CFRE. So when I'm negotiating that contract, I can ask for them to pay the recertification fee. This is very, very common. So don't be afraid to have that conversation. And honestly, I think it's a really good piece of information for you to have because it will be a litmus test on how much your next employer values professional development and continuing education. There's no exam required for recertification. So once you pass that exam, as long as you don't lapse, you will never have to sit for that exam again. Now, you do need to work 30 months out of the three years. If you don't for some reason, let's say you have maternity leave for a year, let's say you're unemployed for nine months, contact our office and we will work with you. Um, we don't want to see, nobody is going to lose their CFRE because they're out on mat leave, right? So just, you can contact us and we will be happy to work with you. For recertification, you need 45 points in continuing education. And that's really doable, right? So what we're saying is about 15 hours a year. So if you go to two conferences, a lot of times that will be a great way that people can get all those points. You could go on 15 one-hour webinars, you know, a lunch 
hour once a week for 15 weeks. Um, as I said, that professional practice is the 30 points. So you working 30 months within those three years. And there are 40 points in professional performance. So you need to keep raising funds, right? Just because you're a C3, you can't be like, oh, that's cool. I don't need to raise any more money. You do need to keep raising money. And something really key to keep in mind is that we look at funds raised as a team sport. You, let's say you run a gala, you run this big dinner and it brings in 40,000, or sorry, let's, let's take that number up. Let's say it brings in $200,000. You know, there's no way to say, well, Christine brought in 50,000 and Candace brought in 70,000 and Ron brought in 19,000, right? We can't do that. So what we look at from a fundraising standpoint is the fundraising team that you are on, right? So that is how you will count that. So I hope that makes sense and that, that makes it easier, but fundraising is a team sport. So that's why we count it like that. Sometimes people say, I would like to talk to somebody who's actually been through the CFRE process. And we do have a CFRE ambassador program and you can email me at share at cfree.org. We have ambassadors all around the world, and I will be happy to connect you with somebody who will be able to share their experience, answer their question, answer your questions, and just be there for you, be your cheerleader, be in your corner, and help you out through this process. So next steps, we've got a couple questions that I will get to on the next slide here. Um, so next steps. I would recommend if you haven't already start your application because it's at no cost to you and you can start logging your education in there. That's what most people do. I also say, we don't care if you use us. If you go, I don't know when you have your annual review, but let's just say you have your annual review on May 1 and you want to tell your boss, I've been doing all this professional development. It can be hard to remember everything that you did over the year, right? If you've been logging everything in your CFRE application, it kind of does double duty. One, it's there working toward your CFRE. Two, it's there for when you have that annual review. You can say, look, I went on these 14 webinars, I went to this awesome conference, I went to this half day workshop, and you have everything there. We do recommend that you update your application as you go. This is one of the big pitfalls is that somebody says, you know what, I think, it's crummy weather today. I'm just going to sit in and I'll just do my CFRE application. And then they can't remember all of the trainings that they've been on over the last five years, right? They're looking at calendars and receipts and they're kind of going crazy. So just go in there, update that as you go along. So with that, I will turn it over to the Q&A. Now, I know we have one question that's come in that's kind of uh, very particular to one person's experience. So I'm going to have to get that answered offline. What is the cost to resit the exam if you don't pass? And how soon can you resit? That's a good question. The cost is 375 US dollars. And I think people freak out when they hear that. And I don't want that to happen to you. That really should be a deterrent um, because we do have people that just think I'm gonna throw my hat in the ring and I'm not gonna study and I'm just gonna walk into the test center and see what happens. You want to become a CFRE the first time you sit for the exam. We want you to become a CFRE the first time you sit for the exam. So if you study, as we looked at with those knowledge domains using the resource reading list, you will be uh, most likely in pretty good shape. If you don't pass, there is a 30-day wait period until you can sit for the exam again. So we just want to make sure that you take that time to study and review everything and get your thoughts together for that. Um, now there's a question here about do secured government contracts count under the secured grant count? So if it's a government contract where you're getting a grant, then yeah, then that would just be counted like a grant that has come in. All right, well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions here. So I will, um, let me see if I have enough bandwidth to put my camera on so I can say a proper, goodbye and thank you. Um, but I'm so glad that you were able to join me today. And 
feel free to email us at succeed at cfre.org with any questions that you have. We really are helpful. We're very easy to work with. We want to help you through this process. So please don't hesitate to get in contact. I will be sending out the slides and those other items that I had mentioned before, the candidate handbook, the links to all that good stuff will be headed your way in the next 24 hours to your inbox. So keep an eye on that. Thank you so much. It was lovely, lovely, lovely to have you all on the call and I wish you all the best. Take care and have a good one.